Hi guys, Talish here. We were planning on getting into TLS performance this week with offloading, but I realized that a lot of information hinges specifically on intermediate certificates. So yeah, I know I asked you guys if you want me to cover intermediate certificates, but I'm just gonna have to cover it anyway. <laughs> Next week, you'll understand why this is important, but today, let's just jump in and knock this one out. So you're familiar with this diagram. The server has a certificate which is signed by the Intermediate Certificate Authority. The Intermediate Certificate Authority has a certificate which is signed by the Root Certificate Authority. The Root Certificate Authority signs its own certificate and convinces the browser or operating system to bundle it. But why do we even need this intermediate step here? Can't we just reduce complication and have the root certificate sign all the server certificates? Yes, we can do this, but you see, the intermediate certificate authorities are a mitigation system. There are only a handful of approved root certificates that make their way into browsers or operating systems, about 200 or so. If they were directly signing the individual website certificates, then they'd be directly in control of the authenticity of vast swaths of the internet. That's a dangerous proposition since it makes them a valuable target for black hat hackers. Remember, in all our examples of being our own certificate authority, we started with creating a root key. Also, I stress that maintaining the security of this key was a gigantic responsibility. In our little internal certificate authority, I just said to make sure it's a secure machine. On the public internet, these keys are so freaking valuable that even after all the regular layers of security that's laid upon them, they're stored on machines which have no network access and remain powered off in a vault. Just think about that for a moment. These are a string of numbers on a drive somewhere that is more precious than all the hardware that is used to generate and store them, even if that hardware was made out of gold. If that one server signed a small slice of the millions of individual server certificates out there today, it would be running non-stop. They'd probably never get a chance to shut it off and lock it up in its vault. And there's no slowdown in sight. Since the advent of things like FireSheep and the Snowden revelations, the rate at which we're signing new certificates just keeps going up. So instead, each root certificate authority signs a certificate for a bunch of intermediate authorities with special flags that also allow them in turn to sign server certificates. Actually, the intermediates can also sign other intermediates, making the chain even longer. However, the main certificate granted from the root authority can have a limitation on how long the chain can go. This process of creating a chain of certificates dilutes the value of attacking one fully operational authority. Any intermediate that's higher up in the chain, or even the root, can easily revoke the certificate of a compromised intermediate authority. This in turn will cause all the server certificates granted by that compromise intermediate, considered invalid. So this is the reason why your browser or operating system may only have less than 200 certificates built in. However, you can purchase a server certificate from a ridiculous amount of intermediates hawking their goods online. This also means that when you purchase a certificate from an intermediate authority, you may also get a certificate chain file to go along with it. This chain file is like a map it defines each intermediate authority in a path to the root certificate. They're typically very easy to implement in the majority of web servers. In Apache, we just need to fill in the SSL certificate chain file. And on Nginx, it's even easier. You just need to append the certificate chain file to the end of your existing server certificate and no other special configuration is needed. It's easy to forget to include the chain file when enabling HTTPS on your server. Actually, a browser may even work perfectly without it because many of the popular intermediate certificate authorities are already stored in the browser. So using your browser is a terrible test to see if your chain is being sent over properly. However, if you were to use our good friend, the OpenSSL command, to test your server certificate, it will fail because it only uses root certificates built into the operating system and needs the intermediate chain data to establish a chain of trust. My suggestion would be to always include a certificate chain on your server and test it with OpenSSL. Gritty details are in the description. But don't worry about this becoming too unwieldy. Usually certificate chains are about two to four certificates long. Although last year, a researcher called Jim Shaver tried to test some browsers with a hundred certificate chain. Some held up, but uh, Firefox bit the dust. 
The link for his experiments in the description below. Okay, easy enough so far, right? Time to get complicated. Remember about three weeks ago, we spoke about how your silver certificates expire. Well, guess what? The certificates that are issued to intermediate authorities also have expiration dates. So what happens if you want a two-year certificate from your intermediate authority and their certificate is only good for one year? Well, they get another certificate from their root certificate authority or even an intermediate authority if they're in a rush and provide you with a chain that contains a new trust path to a root certificate. Every single intermediate can have multiple chains that go up to a root certificate. Here's an interesting twist on this multi-path chain. Let's say there's a new root certificate authority, but they're not installed everywhere yet. And that's because a lot of validation needs to take place before browsers and operating systems accept them. They have the option of creating an internal intermediate certificate authority. And this intermediate authority in turn gets certified from a pre-existing root authority. This way, any certificates granted by the intermediate can use the chain up to the established root authority today. And later, when the new root certificate authority is widely accepted, they can switch you to a new chain to their own root. This is exactly how Let's Encrypt has taken off so quickly in the last few months. All their intermediate certificates chain up to a pre-existing root certificate authority instead of their new root certificate authority. You may hear of this as certificate bridging or cross-signing. There are more complications, don't worry. Remember, we're securely locking away our root key. So how does it use that to sign OCSP responses? Actually, it doesn't. Root certificate authorities still use certificate revocation list since it's a one-way process. The certificate revocation list is dumped every three months and then move to a public server that has no access to the root key. Each list has an issue date and an expiry date. If a new certificate revocation list is not issued before the expiry date, then browsers will start rejecting certificates signed on any chain leading up to that root certificate. As for revoking root certificates themselves, it's easy. Your customers can do that if they want to by just deleting the root certificates from their machines. Or when your browser or operating system wants to drop a root certificate, they'll make it a slow, well-planned process. Or a snap sudden one, which is exactly what they did with DigiNota a few years ago. Within days of learning that the DigiNota root certificate was severely compromised, Microsoft, Mozilla, Google, and Apple all dropped support for the DigiNota root, and that wrecked havoc among many legitimate Dutch sites who had intermediates signed by DigiNota. Yeah, I know, for intricately architected systems, things can break, but the wheels are put into motion pretty fast when they do. I'm sure by now you have a good appreciation that all of this is much more complicated than a little green lock on your browser. There are many moving parts and checks and balances are a little bit complicated. And there's even some that I don't even want to get into. But for now, this is enough to build upon for our topic next week when we start talking about the performance of encrypted connections for your e-commerce store. If you've had horror stories with TLS, share them below. I'm going to be doing a video at the end of this encryption series just on how badly things go when the system breaks. Until then, all the links in the description below. Take care, guys, and I'll talk to you next week.